Okay, excellent. Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome to our program this afternoon here at Montclair State University. My name is Zoe Burkholder. I am your host for this evening. I am the director of the Holocaust, Genocide, and Human Rights Education Project at Montclair State, as well as a professor of educational foundations. Um, our program tonight is on Zoom. You should be able to see a screen that I am sharing with you now, and I have folks who are logging in as we speak. So hello and welcome. Um, I'm gonna drop a link to today's program in the chat box. So you may go ahead and click on that link that will open a Google Doc or you can type in the URL you see on your screen there um, and access our program for today. All right, this is fantastic. We have so many people here. This is really exciting. Thanks for coming. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started because we have a lot to accomplish today and we are excited to have you all here and get started with our program. All right, let's see if we can do this. Okay, um, so a couple of ground rules to get started. We're in a webinar format here, which means that you can see the panelists on your screen, but we can't see you at home. Uh, you're safe. In order for you to interact with us today, we'll invite you to use the chat box and the Q&A feature. So the chat box is chat box can be used as a more informal way to speak, um, to introduce yourself right now. We'd love to sit to know who's here and to hear from you uh, what you're interested in learning about. So go ahead if you're here and introduce yourself in the chat box. You can use the chat box throughout the program. We will not be responding to you um, in the chat box format, but we will you know, see it and have a chance to read it. So it's a chance to um, share your thoughts, your ideas, your experiences, and any feedback you have. If you have a formal question that you'd like us to address through the program, please go ahead and use the Q&A feature. Um, and as you'll see, if people type a question in there, everyone can see your question and you can also um, kind of vote on it if you like the question and want us to consider it or put a comment on the question. So the Q&A feature is functioning today as well. Our schedule for today is going to include um, myself as well as my two invited guests and our presenters for you today. Um, Dr. Lisa Brooks is going to be opening our program uh, with a discussion of scholarship on Native American history and education, and Ms. Trinity Norwood is going to be speaking with us about Native American perspectives on what we should be teaching in terms of Native American history, culture, society, and politics in the United States. So we have a full and robust program. Um, the, we will be ending with a Q&A session. So that's when we're gonna turn to the Q&A is at the end of our program. So please be patient as we get to your questions. We're excited to hear from you all. All right, uh, let me go ahead and introduce our guests with, that are with us here this afternoon. Dr. Lisa Brooks, can you wave to us, Dr. Brooks? <laughs> is a proud citizen of the Choctaw Nation. She has a PhD in curriculum studies with a concentration in gender and women's studies from Oklahoma State University. Her research experience and professional conference presentations span topics from educational activism to tribal sovereignty. sovereignty. Currently, Dr. Brooks is developing the curriculum to accompany the graphic novel Chiloco Indian School, a generational study for the grant funded Chiloco History Project through Oklahoma State University. Her service work focuses on promoting indigenous made curriculum and making indigenous perspectives visible in public education. She also works as a vice principal in the Patterson Public Schools and teaches here at Montclair State University. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Brooks with us today. Thank you. I'm also excited to introduce all of you to Ms. Trinity Norwood, who is a citizen of the Nanticoke Lenny Lenape Tribal Nation in Southern New Jersey. She serves her people as the head coordinator of the Tribal Royalty Program. As an advocate for indigenous peoples, Ms. Norwood works to promote and educate about indigenous issues through multiple mediums, including art, film, and literature. She has been featured on Comcast Newsmakers and interviewed by Kathy O'Donnell for WXPN Kids Corner. As a writer, Trinity creates poetry and short stories that focus on her experiences as a Lenape woman. 
Some of her pieces have been published in the Voices Poetry Anthology Collection and used for local art projects like the Ghost Ship Exhibit at the Race Street Pier. She has also appeared in local historical documentaries like the Philadelphia Experiment and the King's Highway. Ms. Norwood will tell you more about how and why she came to be an Indigenous educator and the work she's doing now throughout the state of New Jersey in just a little bit. For now, um, I thought I would start by opening with a few remarks about why we're here today. And to do so, we need to begin with the land acknowledgement statement. Now, the land acknowledgement statement at Montclair State University is currently still in development. So this is essentially a kind of working draft piece. Um, we have been working closely with the faculty and administration here at Montclair State University with representatives from Native Americans in the state of New Jersey. So this is a collaborative effort and a work in progress. I'd like to read that now. We respectfully acknowledge that Montclair State University occupies land in Lenape Hoking, the traditional and expropriated territory of the Lenape. As a state institution, we recognize and support the sovereignty of New Jersey's three state recognized tribes, the Ramapo Lenape, Nanticoke Lenni Lenape, and Powhatan Renape nations. We recognize the sovereign nations of the Lenape diaspora elsewhere in North America, as well as other indigenous individuals and communities now residing in New Jersey. By offering this land acknowledgement, we commit to addressing the historical legacies of indigenous dispossession and dismantling practices of erasure that persist today. We recognize the resilience and persistence of contemporary indigenous communities and their role in educating all of us about justice, equity, and the stewardship of the land throughout the generations. Thank you. So one of the questions I wanted to start with was this question of why we're here today. Why did um, the three of us come together to create this program for you? And why did over 166 people sign up to join um, this workshop with us today? Thank you for signing up, by the way. We're very excited to have you all here. And of course, the question is, um, you know, how do we do better teaching about Native American history in our schools? And that actually led me to wonder, well, what do we teach about Native American history in our schools? And to answer this question, I mean, there's a lot of ways you can answer this, and I'm sure we all have our own ideas, experiences, thoughts on the matter. But I'm fortunate enough that my daughter is currently a sophomore in high school, which means she's in a US history class at Montclair High School. It's a public school here in, in Montclair. And um, her textbook was sitting at home next to me uh, for US history for, at the high school level. And she's in a kind of pre-AP class. She'll complete the AP curriculum next year. And her class uses a textbook called The American Pageant by David Kennedy and Elizabeth Cohen. Now, Cohen and Kennedy are two of the best, most prominent scholars in US history in the world. They're both professors at Harvard University. And this textbook is comprehensive, um, critical, thoughtful, well-designed, extremely long, if <laughs> some of you know what I'm talking about. I mean, it's gotta be a thousand pages, it's enormous, and it's very, very detailed. So what happens if you crack it open to the index and look up um, Native Americans, which is what I did this morning? And the answer is, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of entries there, which at first I was like, oh, this is great. There's, there's gotta be dozens of entries on Native Americans, lots of page references. So I was really pleased and happy and excited to see that. And I started to then kind of go through and look more carefully at what was being covered. And what I discovered probably will not be a surprise to many of you who are teachers. Um, there was a certain narrative arc to the history of Native Americans within this standardized US history curriculum. Um, and there were some certain kind of core ideas and core features that were presented there. So I selected three images from the textbook to share with you to kind of acknowledge what some of the issues are when we look at how we teach about Native Americans in our textbooks today. Now, remember, this is um, 
the, an AP level textbook by two of the best, very liberal, very progressive historians in the country at a top notch public high school in New Jersey. So this is this is like the best of the best. This is this is what we've got. Um, the first thing you'll notice is that virtually all of the content on Native Americans in the textbook comes from before the turn of the 20th century. So you have this kind of historical arc that begins with the period of colonization and then goes through the Civil War in a kind of up and then down a decline. So that by 1890, 1900, um, there's very little content about Native Americans. Once you hit the 20th century and go forward, they're virtually non-existent in the textbook. Uh, and then when you look more carefully at what is in the textbook, um, you find certain kind of stereotypical portrayals and depictions. Here's an image from the textbook as well as the text that accompanied it. Now this is a painting uh, painted by a white American man in the year 1890 and it is depicting a buffalo hunt. Um, and it was considered an important piece of art representing an important piece of American history. And the text here notes that in fact, by the time the author painted this, image, he had likely never seen a buffalo hunt take place, but instead was reproducing what was a kind of myth of the American plains um, in the American um, Southwest. And so he had traveled there and he met uh, Native American people and he talked to white people and he heard these stories and he painted this image. And the image was, the painting was a prominent one and became um, well known in the United States. And it depicts Native Americans engaging in this kind of traditional act, right? Buffalo hunting with spears and knives and horses um, in a very traditional way. Now scholars would call this a representation of the noble savage. Um, it's a kind of like uh, underhanded compliment, right? Like on the one hand, uh, we're depicting Native Americans in kind of noble ways and kind of admirable ways. Um, they're depicted with um, sympathy and interest and even admiration. And on the other hand, so they're kind of noble in this way. And on the other hand, they're also savage. Um, they're unable to participate in modern life. They, they use um, old fashioned tools and techniques. Um, they engage in um, savagery, right? So there's this kind of like double handed perspective at work here. Um, out of touch in terms of what was really happening at that time in 1890 and also um, highly mythologized in terms of the content depicted in a very stylized way. I have two more images to share with you. The second one shows a illustration that is supposed to explain to students how Native American land disappeared over time. So you can see uh, it's a map of the United States and the green part there represents Native American territory. And you can see it shrinking, shrinking, shrinking over time. And then text beneath says vanishing lands. Once masters of the continent, Native Americans have been squeezed into just 2% of territory. Now here we see a clear representation of what I would call the disappearing Indian trope. Um, and scholars have identified this. This is, this is a common um, narrative, it's a myth that, that we tell in the United States of America about Native Americans and essentially the idea is that they were once prominent, they were once powerful, they were once masters of the continent, but they have literally physically disappeared and vanished as have their lands. Um, the final text, uh, the final illustration that I have from the textbook is a kind of development on the same theme. Here we have a photograph from 1881. Uh, of the Standing Rock Reservation. And the text here reads, once the scourge of the plains, the Lakota, part of the Sioux tribes, were reduced by the 1890s to the humiliation of living on government handouts. And the photograph, if you look at it, depicts um, white men standing in the middle of Native Americans who are sitting on the ground around them uh, with stacks of something in the middle there. I assume it's sacks of grain or rice or something that they're distributing um, to people. And here we have a kind of another theme that is depicted in various ways accidentally, but definitely very clearly throughout this US history textbook is that Native Americans have been um, uh, kind of vanquished as well as vanished. They were conquered by this time in the 1880s. They were subjects and subjugated. Um, they were no longer 
meaningful historical actors, but instead recipients of government handout. Uh, they were humiliated and they were conquered. I mean, these are images and texts. These are the stories that are pretty clearly represented in our textbooks today, which is um, somewhat astonishing, I think. Now, there are more positive representations in there as well, but it's not clear what the narrative is supposed to be. And there's a literal disappearing that takes place at the turn of the 20th century. So when you move forward in time, the only example I found referring to Native Americans in the 20th or 21st century um, was two sentences, no images, that said the Navajo people helped as code talkers during World War II, um, which they did, by the way. But you know, there's just there's not a kind of fuller and, and more robust or more critical history that is in this textbook. And so I think obviously this is just one textbook. And I did a very quick look at it this morning. Um, and I'm sure there's different textbooks that have different presentations, but it gives us a sense of what we're up against, what we're dealing with, and what we need to do and do better and learn, how we need to supplement the textbook, the official curricula um, with alternatives outside of the curricula, which by the way, I would like to add that the teachers at Montclair High School, including my daughter's history teacher, has supplemented the curriculum so beautifully this year. And I know a lot of teachers are doing this work in New Jersey. They're bringing in outside readings, they're bringing in different perspectives, and they're doing their best to really transform the message as it is depicted in these textbooks and bring in a more critical lens. So thank you to those of you who are doing that. What could a different perspective on teaching Native American history look like? How do we do this work better? That is the work that we're here to do today. And so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pass the mic now to my friend and colleague, Dr. Lisa Brooks, and she's gonna give us a perspective from a scholar as well as um, an indigenous uh, educator and activist working to help transform the way that we teach about Native American people, history, and culture in the public schools. Thank you. Okay. Kalito, Chimachukma, Sohofcho Yat, Dr. Lisa Brooks. Okay. Hello, everybody. How are you? My name is Dr. Lisa Brooks, and I am Choctaw. And I want to thank everyone here, um, especially, you know, uh, Dr. Brookholder and um, Ms. Norwood for being here and, and, and helping us put on this very um, needed and, um, and, and wonderful presentation. I'm really grateful to be a part of it. And I just want to say that before anything else, before I struggle um, to present my screen, which I'm going to try to do, I have just a few slides here, um, if possible. I'm gonna try. Oh nope, I don't. Okay, so I'm. It's disabled. That's okay. I'm just gonna go ahead and and that's all right. I don't need it. If if I wander, you'll you'll get back in. So um, I just want to start um, and give a really quick um, kind of um, not an intro to an intro, but um, but just kind of add a few thoughts to expand that a little bit. Um, uh, I um, am from Oklahoma. I have been a um, you know, I, 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 when I introduce myself, I say I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation, not a member of the Choctaw Nation, because that's how I was taught by my tribe to speak because, um, and that's why I'm introducing that here um, in this forum, because it's important for, you know, me to express that, you know, um, at the time of removal, um, the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek um, in September of 1830 was created between two sovereign nations. You know, two sovereign nations came together, and um, as the result of us having lost or been on the wrong side of the uh, Indian Wars and siding with the French, um, we were vulnerable and ceded up to eventually two million acres of land. And so, um, for us, you know, our negotiations with the federal government have always been sovereign to sovereign. You know, um, other nations in the world acknowledge us as. Um, a sovereign entity. And I think that a lot of the misconceptions that we're going to be talking about today is, is due to things that are happening, you know, textbooks that are written or, or perceptions that happen is because it feels like things are relegated to the past when essentially, you know, the governments of, of different tribes and the federal government have been discussing and, and um, behind the scenes since the beginning, since the 1700s and uh, definitely since 1776. So, um, I wanted to kind of just just kind of make that make that context for you um, before I begin. Um, you know, I, I wanted to draw attention to a few things just based on that introduction. Um, this, the little hidden histories that we have 
um, in, in 1830, when um, removal began for the Choctaws from the uh, Mississippi area um, and moving to Oklahoma Indian Territory at the time, through that experience, right, um, it took about four years for removal to be complete at the cost of at least 2,500 um, Choctaw lives, and that's not the grand total of what would be called the Trail of Tears. But it's often misunderstood, you know, and the, the images that Dr. Brunkel just showed, you know, about the paternalism and the, um, you know, the, the loss of and the tragic state of Native Americans after, you know, um, the federal government came in and decided, you know, um, to, to, to grab land and do the things that happened, and, you know, that we're all very aware of. I think that the miss, the hidden histories in there, the hidden curriculum is, is it where we're, would be uh, to the point of that, you know, two years after um, removal, Choctaws were already building and, and assembling schools. Chickasaws at the same time, you know, when the same thing happened for them, were creating academies that weren't even run by the federal government. Schooling systems, you know, there were um, educational systems, there was, gov you know, governmental and, and cultural systems that it happened even during re removal, right? So, um, but that's not something that's well known. And I would say even being from a place that, that um, there's a lot of, of Native Americans, a lot of different tribes represented, um, in, in Oklahoma that still probably maybe more than 90% of the people I meet still believe the very first people removed were um, Cherokees and not Choctaws. And I believe that this is important to bring up because it's that exact kind of misinformation or that the, those kind of details that get lost. And it doesn't seem important to many people, you know, well, you know, Cherokees versus Choctaws, because it doesn't, you know, it, people can, can push everybody together in a big lump, but, but that's not to be the case. And so I think I kind of wanted to make that here, you know, clear here that that just those little details that that make the difference in perception between um, you know, a, a people who are antiquated or, or can be relegated into history versus people who are resilient and um, and building and growing. You know, we're talking about vital rich cultures that were amassing wealth in the 1700s, you know due to really extensive trades, you know, with Europeans. And so sometimes the, the history gets rewritten several different ways. And I think that, you know, from my experience in, in education as an educator, as an educator in higher um, education is that there are a couple issues with that, you know, um, getting access, and, and I'll talk about this more in a second, but, you know, getting access to those details and understanding those hidden histories that really build our perception is kind of key as an educator now to moving forward, you know, with this desire to really get it right. Um, so, so, you know, modern discussions, how's, you know, what's happening in, in the education, um, I think the, the theme is it, it's complicated. Right, history is complicated. There are all kinds of things that that tribes are dealing with now. Supreme Court decisions that change, you know, what reservations are or how cases get prosecuted. Um, so different aspects of sovereignty continue to be an issue, and sometimes you can get lost in the paperwork of all that, and and it can be very confusing. And I think that um, the the theme is, you know, not to let, um, not to not to shy away from that complication in history. You know, don't avoid. Oversimpl uh, don't avoid complicated nature of things because things are that way. You know, avoid oversimplification whenever possible. You know, um, it's and it happens over and over again. My participation in the Shiloko, um Indian boarding school, again and again, people want to focus on you know the the tragic and and truly the tragic nature of, of boarding schools and and make that the singular focus when sometimes that narrative overshadows another narrative which existed at the same time, which was that boarding schools, while, you know, um, disseminating, just, just completely, just, um, you know, destroying Native identity to a certain extent and removing kids tragically, sometimes at the expense of their life from their families, actually created an experience where children were only surrounded by Native Americans 24-7 for 12 years. So in some sense, you know, Native identity you know, had a chance to evolve in, in certain places into a pan American idea, pan um, Native American identity that that sort of it contributed to the resilience that you experience today. So I, I say that together to, to kind of illustrate the complicated nature of that story and how, you know, it's in the hands of every educator who, who you know, dares to bring these things up to, to bring forth you know, the, the multiple facets of this kind of history. And I think a lot of that happens by, by you know, becoming better educated. And I know there's always more for me to learn and, and to do. And, and I always go back to the source. I'm a big, big believer of picking up the phone and, and calling the people I need to call to get that. Um, I don't have my slides, so I just wanted to kind of venture really fast into a few things. Um, you know, sovereignty is always an issue. I'm gonna make- You wanna, try, to, you wanna try those slides again? 
comfortable so just, with yeah, the work. Really fast. It, they probably weren't super exciting anyway. That's it. They're up. All right. All right. So um, this is the, the great scale of the Choctaw Nation. All right. So here we go. And uh, Wendy Redstar is the artist that I kind of um, consolidated into the back here. So here's a few images for you. Um, Bloomfield Academy and Wheelock Academy are, are terrific examples here of, of, um, of our attempts, you know, of, of tribal attempts to establish solid and high quality education before, you know, sometimes up to 25 years before the federal boarding school system. So I think that's often missed. And I wanted to kind of illustrate that as a point to make sure that you guys knew that there's so much more to all of these stories, right? All right. So, um, Okay, so so modern issues. I think that you know if you're going to go on, uh, there's a few places that I always go to, um, as I can rely on 100%. And for me, it's American Indian Quarterly is one of them. Um, there, I I know who to trust as far as scholars go, and that's where I rely on um, and go back to. And so, um, and I just say that you know as a preference uh, for myself. Um, but anyway, you know, commonly I was trying to think of it as in a global way, modern issues are um, that Native Americans, even if they are in academia, even if they um, are publishing or, you know, unless you're presenting to other Native Americans, it is often that our knowledge is discounted by other experts, right? Um, hiring or developing curriculum or being a part of um, um, a, the, the, the people who, the, the systems that disseminate knowledge it's often that Native Americans will be um, tokenly, ad, you know, admitted to the table, but then not truly um, respected. Their knowledge is sometimes overruled by people who are those experts. And, and I have a great example of that. Um, I was talking to the head archaeologist of um, Choctaw Nation. He's an amazing man. And um, he was explaining to me um, that when National Geographic, who you would think, I can trust them, right? National Geographic. It's four o'clock. Oh, it's four o'clock. Um, National Geographic would, um, you know, called in one of their um, Native American, uh, one of the Choctaws to contribute to an episode of the Mound Builders that they were having and producing a series of, and it was a, it was an, it was a really interesting series, but, you know, when they went and filmed on location, you know, they didn't include, you um, the information based on our experience of what mounds were for. And instead of relying on our information, our culturally based historical information that's passed down from person to person, that knowledge was, was you know, given to and then um, re remade into whatever fit a theory you know, that, that served an expert that got their name on the top of the document, you know, so, so essentially a lot of Native Americans at this point or, or contributions to education seem to be, you know, we're the second tier and consulted with, you know, that line right there. So, and just, you know, a few other points here to kind of, to kind of expand on this conversation and let, um, and let uh, Ms. Norwood kind of take over here is, is that sovereignty is always an issue. Sovereignty is overlooked, misunderstood, and is often not given its due as a dangerous concept. You know, um, sovereignty is alive and is, is, um, it is a dangerous thing. You know, it is a contested thing and it can change people's lives. Truly acknowledging treaties at every level for every, every treaty made um, by the federal government, you know, it's, it's a, it's a dangerous and, and, um, and um, in an open uh, you know, it's an open dialogue, right? So there's so much going on with that. And that's such, such an important issue that continues to be explored. And it's often overlooked as a, as a feature um, for, for most people. Um, also, you know, a history is written, rewritten, re written, rewritten, and overly simplified, right? Uh, and, and again, you know, we, we always try to try to avoid that whenever possible, because stories are often complicated, and our kids can handle that, right? So um, uh, again, you know, a lot of times people, especially that, that, view themselves as allies of, of, um, of Native voices tend to focus on trauma rather than resiliency. You know, it's, it's what's highlighted in the textbook again, but not the, not the story behind, you know, it's the, it's the trauma of removal, but not the long and, and drawn out fights in the 40s and 50s to remove, you know, federal government um, and investment in selecting chiefs, right? Or, or just, you know, issues related to the, the nitty gritty of, of how to establish Indian health systems and how to continue to serve people. So there's so much that's not explored. And you might be saying to yourself, well, sure, but why haven't um, people been, you know, just shouting this information from the rooftops? And that's because I would say that a lot of this information is still sensitive. You know, there's a lot of things that aren't written. 
there's a lot of things that aren't written for people outside of these communities because these issues are still ongoing and the very um, action on these issues can change the lives of Native Americans today. You know, so so there's there's always there's always that um, you know that um, idea. Well, if there's misconception, people should be shouting it from the rooftops. It's not always in everyone's best interest, depending on where you live. You know, whether you live in Oklahoma or you live in Montana or you live in California, you know, there are different social contexts that would mean that correcting misinformation may not always be in the best interest of the people there. So that's kind of a bigger conception for you as well. And the last thing that I would just say is, is one of the biggest, and it's the lack of appreciation for modern Native identities and voices and, and, and not opening that door for that to be something that people can experience or, um, you know, understand. And I love, I love social media for this, right? TikTok has all these things where, you know, there's um, throat singers and there's people out there. There's um, a lot of women running right now in the Boston or had run in the Boston Marathon, um, you know, that were posting all over Instagram, Native women running. And so there's a lot of things out there that can really, you know, explore and expand our notion of, of Native identity, and I think that's a, a worthy thing to pursue. So, I really appreciate you giving me a few minutes to to kind of kind of open those doors, and uh, just say thank you so much to everybody. Wanishi, I'm gonna jump right on in here. Um, I want to say thank you. Um, so much. I, I don't know if you guys noticed, I was writing things down as you guys were talking. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to add this to all future PowerPoints. Thank you so much for your words. Um, they were extremely powerful. Ita, Quango Melo Humo, Eloenzi, Wiratami Kekekwan. I greet you in the language of my ancestors. My name is Trinity Norwood. I am a citizen of the Nanticoke Glen Island Ape Nation of South Jersey. I'm excited to be here with you today um, and spend a little bit of time um, talking about how we can decolonize our classrooms and make them safe spaces for Indigenous students, as well as spaces for non-Indigenous students to appreciate and not appropriate Native culture. Um, before I get started, I have three simple rules um, for every presentation that I do. The first one is that this is a safe space, this is a space for learning. Um, so if you have a question, feel free to ask it. Um, I will do my best to answer it. Um, and I understand that although the topics that we are going to touch on today can be sensitive, um, things are coming with a good heart and we're, we're all here to learn. And, and we can't break these issues down unless we have some uncomfortable conversations. Um, my second rule is, although you can ask me anything, that does not mean that I have the answer. And I will be very quick to just say, I don't know. Um, but I, I've got quite a few people in my corner and I can probably do research to get you the right answer. Um, my third rule is that um, I am speaking to you today as a Lenape woman. I, Native people are not a monolith. I do not presume to speak for all Native people. I do not presume to speak for all Lenape people. Um, the information that I'm going to provide for you is either historical fact or things that I have accumulated through research and um, working with um, Indigenous students and Indigenous educators. Um, another thing I want to mention, this came up in a presentation I had last week, I do interchangeably use the terms Indigenous, Native, and Indian. I don't find um, Indian in the right context offensive, <laughs> um, but I know that it is very important to ask a native or indigenous person how they feel about that term. Um, so I, 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 do, I do want to mention that. So you'll, you'll hear me use them interchangeably, but when interacting with indigenous people, uh, my rule of thumb is to ask them how they prefer to be identified. Um, many people prefer to be identified directly with their, their tribal affiliation, with their ancestry. Um, but I'll be using those terms generally as we talk about native history and teaching in general. Um, when I was in school, the section in my history book that spoke about Native Americans was just a few paragraphs long, um, or about a page if you were lucky, um, and had more pictures than words. Native people were talked about in a generalized past tense, concentrated mostly on Western Plains tribes, even though I was here in New Jersey and only about the way they interacted with Europeans. 
And unfortunately, even though that was almost 20 years ago, for many schools and educational organizations, not much has changed. Um, at one point in my educational career, I distinctly remember one of my history books ending its Native American section about how Lenape people had left the East Coast and now all lived in reservations in Oklahoma. While I was a Lenape person existing right there in that classroom, and I had to fight back tears as my peers looked at me questionably. Um, if their history book said it and their teacher read it, it must be correct, right? Um, and unfortunately, this is not an uncommon situation for many Native students across the country. Um, colonialism rears its ugly head in our educational institutions in every way, um, not just in the books in our classrooms. For example, I come from a family with three children. We all went through the same school system. And although my parents had filled out our demographic information with intention, checking off both African American and Native American under race, each of us graduated high school with a different classification. My older brother was classified as African American. My paperwork said that I was Latino. My little brother who graduated in 2011 actually did have both check marks on his paperwork. So I guess my parents did enough yelling that they finally listened by the third child. Um, this is a deeply rooted issue. Misclassification has been a tool of colonialism since the beginning of the practice of having a census. Um, but I, I won't get on, on my soapbox about that, but it is a, a yet another example of how colonialism is so deeply rooted into all of our institutions um, and contributed to erasure in that school. And my older brother graduated in 2002, I graduated in 2007. Um, another experience that will never leave my memory is one that my younger brother has to live with. Um, when he was just in the fifth grade, uh, I don't know how it came up in his classroom, but the teacher asked a question referring to someone who doesn't wear shoes. And one of his fellow students said, oh, a Native American boy. And my younger brother felt strong enough to stand up for himself. And he said, well, that doesn't make any sense because I am a Native American boy and I've got my sneakers on right now. And the teacher proceeded to berate him and ask him, how it's possible that he's native and someone in his family must have had sex with a black person was her response to a fifth grader who was trying to express his indigeneity. Um, we were blessed to have some very boisterous parents and um, trainings were required for all the teachers at the school and it was a big to do. But, you know, un unfortunately, just like my previous two examples, those are those things are not uncommon for Native students. We are constantly required to prove who we are in a space that is supposed to be safe for learning. Um, although these damaged feelings um, do stay with me to this day, so does the pivotal moment of feeling recognized in my classroom. In high school, I had an English teacher that added a section on contemporary native writers to her curriculum. Not only did I feel seen, but her recognizing that native people were contributing to our modern world and not just a paragraph in my history book inspired many of my fellow students to expand their perspectives and gain a newfound respect and understanding for my people. It was such an uplifting experience that I still get emotional about it 15 years after high school. And it is that spirit um, giving indigenous students visibility in the classroom that I want to concentrate on for the next couple minutes, um, starting by asking the question, what constructs in our classroom, whether we realize it or not, perpetuate colonialism and racism? I have a few slides I would like to share. Can everyone see my slides? All right, good, good. Okay. Um, this information I have gleaned from personal experience, speaking with indigenous students who are currently going to school in New Jersey and speaking with indigenous educators across the country. 
Of course, it's not all inclusive where we'd be here all day talking about erasure, but it highlights some of the common issues I found um, at all grade levels. Um, erasure in the classroom happens in many different ways. Um, one of the um, common threads I found in talking to both people sitting in desks and sitting at the front of the classroom was terminology that's used in classrooms. Uh, Native Americans believe, um, I, I count this as one of my um, misconception red flags. Uh, I said earlier, Native people are not a monolith. We all have our own distinct tribal traditions, ceremonies, language groups. To pack us all into one sentence is offensive and, and racist. Um, I, I see signs all the time, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a meaningful quote, and then it says Native American proverb. Well, what tribe did this come from? That's, that's, you know, we don't have all the same sayings. We do have plenty of linked and common traditions, but we're all distinct. Um, and a lot of history books, um, and historians have just grouped us all together. I was watching a, a I can't remember what show I was watching, but um, it, it just constantly kept on saying, oh, you know, the Native Americans used to, the Native Americans used to. We are all separate people and we should be appreciated for our individual uh, cultures and pride. Um, another thing that happens constantly is using, uh, talking about Native people only in the past tense. This perpetuates the idea that we are no longer here. Um, history books even, as I said earlier, even history books even sometimes blatantly say that we're not here anymore. And that is not true. Um, the understanding and using the correct words for removal versus a migration or a displacement. Um, it, it, removal absolutely happened. But here in New Jersey specifically, we have a wonderful example. Uh, the Lenape people were displaced. We were forced on migrations, but Lenape people also stayed here. And that is something that is specific to Lenape people here and should be recognized. There's also many tribal uh, nations that unfortunately were completely removed from their ancestral lands. And they have a different story and different traumas that they have to work through because of that. Um, but deciding that we're going to just generalize the term is damaging to our distinct stories throughout history. Another thing that contributes to erasure in the classroom is that we're only studied in history class. Um, I, I, I didn't have a, a Native American studies class until I got to college. Um, and like I said, my first teacher who talked about native people anytime past the 1800s was my junior high school, uh, my junior in high school English teacher. And that was something that she had added. Um, we talk about native people only in connection to how colonialism affected them. And then they drop off <laughs> and, and we were here, we are still here and we are contributing to every, all subjects. So why can't we talk be talked about in all subjects? We are writers, we are scientists, we are mathematicians. We are contributing to society and we should be recognized in those spectrums. Uh, another thing that happens um, is acknowledging only federally recognized tribes. Here in New Jersey, we have three state recognized tribes. The conversation of state versus federal and the uh, getting our heads around tribal sovereignty it could be a, a week long conversation easily, um, but it is important to recognize where you are and to not put your own preconceived notions on a tribal community based on their recognition. I, I worked with, uh, and it was an arts organization. Um, I did a training on land acknowledgements and they went back and they made their land acknowledgement and they only recognized federal Lenape tribes in their land acknowledgement when a state recognized Lenape person was the one who did the training for this to happen. Um, so, you know, and that's a situation where it, it was accidental, it was inadvertent, but it contributed to erasure. And it was something that they had already posted and published. So it was perpetuating erasure out <laughs> in public space. Um, I, I purposefully separated um, erasure and trauma in the classroom. When I have experienced erasure, it has 
in my experience, of course, kind of a disassociating effect on me. I closed myself off because I felt invisible. While with trauma, it feels like a ripping open for all of my vulnerability to be seen by my classroom without my permission. Both are very damaging, but in distinctly different ways. Um, so some of the traumas that are experienced by many Native students, um, and this is a hot button issue, particularly in New Jersey, we have a lot of schools with mascots, is mascot caricatures. They are a awful, damaging representation of the beauty of Native people. And my youngest brother, actually both of my brothers, but I, I remember this experience particularly with my younger brother. Um, he was a basketball player and he went to a school for a game and there was a giant caricature of an Indian dancing around a drum with a huge nose and little slots for eyes, screaming all, all up the wall in the gym. And he couldn't pull himself together enough to play his game. Um, and, and that's something that any Native students who went to that school had to experience every single day. Um, so, you know, how can we create a safe space for students to want to learn when they're being bombarded with those kind of images every day in a classroom? Um, another, another thing, I call it the class look back. Um, I, I sat in classes and, and, and plenty of Native students have sat in class. And whenever the subject of Native people comes up or, you know, relocations or, or Thanksgiving or Columbus Day, you get the classroom look back where all of your fellow students stare back at you and make you feel so unbelievably uncomfortable in your own skin. And it is, it is traumatizing, but it is, it is, I guess it is also very isolating. Um, and it, it, it's overlooked by many teachers in my experience, it was overlooked. Uh, they get the, they, I'd get the look back and the teacher would just keep moving through as opposed to correcting that behavior. Um, another uh, classroom trauma is to tokenism. Um, an, expecting a native student to become the teacher or approve anything in the classroom that is connected to native culture and history. You know, that's not a student's job. Um, they're, they're, they're there to learn and, and they shouldn't have to represent all Native people. Uh, a lot of people of color um, experience this. Um, celebrations around Columbus Day and Thanksgiving. I, I have mentioned, you know, my family would take us out of school um, so that we wouldn't have to be in school during those days because they are very triggering days. Um, you know, Thanksgiving is, is, a, is a day of memorial for uh, my family and for many Native people, it was it was a day of it's a historical day of tragedy that you know we it smiled and laughed about and and it's crazy to me. This is my little soapbox, sorry, but it's crazy to me because we have other national holidays that are Memorial Days, but Thanksgiving we just ignore like it's supposed to be a happy and beautiful day, um, and and ignoring the historical facts behind those days, Columbus Day and Thanksgiving. Um, reinforces false narratives about those days. Uh, another a classroom final classroom trauma is uh, displaying racist imagery without context. Um, I, the the, um, the uh, Buffalo Hunt picture is a perfect example of this. Um, and, and thank you so much for breaking it down and showing what was really happening behind, you know, the context behind that piece of art. Um, I, I was in a classroom once and uh, we turned the page and it had an image of oh, dead bodies at wounded knee. And when I, the teacher was not prepared <laughs> for, for us to turn the page to that. And, and I, I think that um, he handled it correctly and we closed it and we had a conversation surrounding it. But uh, yeah, but I've also been in spaces where, you know, we're just bombarded with these traumatic images about, you know, that reinforces this idea that Native people were just helpless and being thrown back and forth, you know, and, and where things were just happening to them, um, as opposed to really pulling apart the historical context of 
of terrible traumatic images. Um, so how do we combat this trauma and erasure and create an inclusive and safe classroom? Next, I'm going to go through a list of best practices I have compiled by speaking to Indigenous educators and researching some uh, pedagogy for other subjects that can be difficult to navigate, much like slavery and the Holocaust. Again, this is an all-inclusive. Um, I'm sure things will pop into my head even while we're reading through this together, um, but I think it is a well-rounded start to decolonizing our classrooms. So don't play dress up. That is at the top of my list. There have been quite a few news stories over the past year or so where teachers have done this, um, which is really an insane subject to me. Um, I, I had a teacher actually once say, well, this is the best way for me to um, get my uh, young students to understand native culture. And I said, well, how do you teach your young students about enslaved people? You don't get dressed up as an enslaved person, do you? because I know you teach them about that. Um, and I think that was her light bulb moment <laughs> when she was like, oh, I'm overstepping. Um, but don't play dress up. There's plenty of ways to express and show and help children appreciate native culture without appropriating our clothes. Um, our regalia, I call what we were regalia because a regalia is something that expresses who you are while a costume is playing dress up. You're wearing something to change who you are. Our regalia is significant and many items have ceremonial aspects to them. Um, in Lenape tradition, your regalia is typically made as a gift from someone who cares about you deeply. So to minimize all of that spiritual significance to a costume for fun is thoroughly offensive. Um, so don't play dress up, but use images to illustrate um, our culture. There is powwows.com is a great example. I've, I've gotten pictures from there um, that show wonderful images of how natives express their culture in modern day. Um, don't make native people a monolith. Um, use place-based precise language. Um, here, as teachers in New Jersey, it is important that uh, students learn about Lenape history, what was here before all our buildings and our roads and all that good stuff. Um, you know, what, what was here, what was it called, Lenape hoking, um, appreciate. And I also think it gives students a, a wonderful perspective on where they are. Um, if they realize, you know, there were people here 10,000 years ago before me, it didn't just start when Europeans ended up on this shore. Um, use precise language, uh, use the term Lenape. If you're talking about other tribal communities and traditions, um, recognize those other tribal communities and traditions. Don't use the all Native Americans believe thing. Um, associating, don't associate Native people solely with colonialism. Teach pre-colonial American history. Um, it is important that uh, we recognize that Native people were not just, I, I, I'm trying to figure out the word I want to use. Native people were not just sitting here waiting to be conquered. We had tribal governments and structures and villages, and we had treaties between tribal communities. We had regular migration trails. You know, we were an active, organized communities. We had language groups um, and families and traditions. We were not just, you know, the savages sitting around waiting. We were, we were organized people and it is important. And we were organized people to the point that our practices from 10,000 years ago, we still see remnants of today and are still being practiced today. Um, a great example of this is uh, controlled burning. It's a practice that is used by many of our national parks that is a native practice um, to combat wildfires. Uh, many of our streets and cities and towns here in New Jersey were Lenape walking trails. Some of our towns are where Lenape villages were. Um, so there are plenty of things that happened prior to colonialism here in New Jersey that students can learn about. And it, it gives a more dynamic image 
of Lenape people and, and native people at large prior to colonialism, there's estimated to be 500 native nations here in just the continental United States. You know, there is a lot of stories to be told prior to colonialism. Um, don't teach colonialism as if it just happened to native people. I have sat in classrooms where um, it, the idea that it was a oops, <laughs> colonialism was an oops to native people. It was a byproduct um, of Europeans coming here, but no, it was the main goal of Europeans coming here. It wasn't a, oh, we had a confusion and that's why, you know, th this treaty didn't work out and uh, the walking purchase, a lot of native people lost their land. No, it, it, was, it was a systematic process of erasure and genocide here on our shores. And it, it needs to be recognized as such. Um, we, we can't heal from those traumas unless we recognize them as purposeful traumas. Um, colonialism, the doctrine of discovery, which is not talked about often in, in classrooms, those were uh, Indian boarding schools, those were laws and systems set up to erase Native people um, and to act like erasure was just a byproduct of what was happening because so many people were um, moving to these lands does a great disservice to our students because they don't understand why the world is the way it is now. Um, it's important to talk about colonial from, colonialism from both perspectives, um, which I just kind of highlighted, but an example I wanna use of this is um, understanding the concept of land ownership. Um, here for Lenape people, we used a practice which was much more like leasing. So in Lenape Hoking, there were plenty of other native people um, who lived in our territorial lands. But what we would do is typically annually, there would be some sort of um, ceremony to kind of reissue that promise that these people are going to live here, they're going to take care of the land in the proper way. And there would be some sort of gift giving. Uh, when Europeans came here, their understand of land ownership was dominion as opposed to leasing and stewardship. So once they had the initial treaty signed with the Lenape people, they thought, oh, this is ours now. So you can't pass these lines, but borders was a foreign concept. And you know, understanding both sides and how that clash happened can better uh, illustrate uh, native culture for students. Don't compare pain or trauma, um, but do highlight how historical events affected groups differently. Um, I was on a panel, this was pre-pandemic, um, that I felt turned into a jousting match of what marginalized group had the worst trauma story. Um, and it, it did all of us a disservice and we were all just emotionally exhausted at the end. Um, and, and I think that uh, it is easy to accidentally fall into that cycle of, of comparing pain and trauma, not only between um, uh, marginalized groups, but also between tribal communities. There are some things that, um, for lack of a better term, have gotten much more, actually I'm gonna say much more notoriety um, because I think that they have been mystified a bit. For example, the Trail of Tears, uh, you know, it, uh, or uh, it, it just has been compiled into something that people just like talking about. And there's these triggers of historical things that have happened that people fall on about Native people. Well, there were a lot of tragedies that happened here in New Jersey um, for Lenape people. Um, and and we have to make sure that we are telling the full story and not just you know, the ones that happened that are more popular in history. Don't box native history from mainstream American history. Integrate your timeline. Um, native people have been contributing to society throughout time. Um, and it's important that we don't, you don't just stop talking about us in after the 1800s. Um, we have been inventors, uh, we have been politicians, um, it, we can be a part of that time. And I also think a, a, a great advantage of that is it, it gives students the understanding that we are still here. Um, you know, you, we can't teach about Native people up until the 1800s and then say, oh, but they're still here. <laughs> what happened for that big chunk of time? Um, so it's important to integrate the timeline and, and 
and add things. Uh, uh, we someone mentioned uh, the code talkers. Um, that's an important contribution that Native people have made. But additionally, uh, Native people have been uh, enlisted in our armed forces uh, at an exponential rate throughout all of our wars as a country. Um, you know, it is not just one thing. Don't overwhelm student, students with disturbing images and dramatic feeling statistics. Um, it's important to balance trauma with triumph. Um, our stories aren't just about depletion and sadness and strife and struggle. Um, although that is an aspect of what has happened to many Native communities um, here in the United States, we also have had great triumphs. Just here in New Jersey, just a few years ago, uh, the three state recognized tribes had a great triumph because they received their state recognition again after the state tried to deny it of us, but that was a great triumph. Um, and it, it's important not to overwhelm students with disturbing images. It can be traumatic for an indigenous student and it can also be traumatic for a non-indigenous student. Uh, you know, if, if I'm in a presentation and I just say to students, um, you know, it, it's estimated that about 90% of the Lenape uh, population here in Lenape Hoking um, was decimated by 1800. Does that make it sound like there's no more Lenape people left? Yeah, so a, a statistic outside of context can be very damaging to a student's idea of Native people. Um, a, a wonderful example was that was the image earlier of the map of native land in the US and how it kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, that, that's a very, it was very jarring to look at for a student, but you, to go further into it, recognize that what was happening at that time, you know, there was, uh, I don't wanna get the dates wrong, so I'm not going to say that, <laughs> but there was a, a big push. I wanna say mid 19, 50s, 60s, there was a great push to get Native people off of reservations and back into urban centers. Um, and with that, many uh, treaties were ignored and many reservations were reduced in size. So there are a lot of factors that made that map look so dramatic that probably were not acknowledged in that book. Oh, come on, please. I know that's not my last slide. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, so I wanted to end on a higher note rather than talking about all of our issues here. Um, how can we all work together to create an inclusive classroom? Um, highlighting our living culture and how students can appreciate not appropriate native culture. Um, uh, creating experiences for them to get um, an indigenous perspective. We're, uh, now there is a lot of um, resources online to get indigenous perspectives on, on subjects. Um, our tribal powwow, second weekend in June at the Salem County Fairgrounds, is a wonderful way to appreciate native culture. Um, add contributions from native people to all subjects, not just history. Um, I, I did talk about this a little bit earlier, but as a wonderful example, Deb Holland is, is an amazing person doing amazing things. Um, there are plenty of native, more pop culture references, but there are plenty of native actors who are doing a lot of things. Young people in our native communities have been at the forefront of uh, water protection protests and things of that nature. Um, so there are plenty of things happening right now today in our communities um, that are affecting everyone, you know, a, a native a water protection protest, protecting water, it's everybody's problem, um, uh, that are contributing to our world and, and, and give, and would give students a great perspective on how vibrant our cultures are. Avoid creating trauma for indigenous students, giving them a heads up. Um, there are some subjects that are very difficult for a student to be in. I spoke about Columbus Day and Thanksgiving. Um, giving a student a heads up and the space to be able to decide that they're not prepared to be in that classroom um, during that point in time, I think is, is a great practice. Um, practice, I got this from actually one of my teacher friends. 
full senses learning about indigenous culture. Um, so she, I worked with her, um, she's at the uh, Philadelphia School and they have integrated native culture into almost everything. So they have a uh, indigenous garden where they have the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, and the students planted that garden, you know, so they got this interactive thing and it's continuing to grow. In their music classes, they have a section on uh, native uh, uh, flute and drum music. It talks about um, the history behind the native drum. Uh, there's actually gets specifically into Lenape drums. We have a couple of drums that are, are significant to our tribe as well as um, the powwow style drums, large drums. Um, and they appreciate the culture without appropriating. Nobody is drumming on these drums, but they get to listen to the music and they get to understand and appreciate the ceremonial significance behind the music. Um, in their um, uh, English class, they, have a unit where they um, use some Lenape words and she goes through her classroom and she puts Lenape words on things so that they can start to learn it and just integrate that into, th these are um, elementary school students, but she's integrated that into every single subject so that they can have a diverse view of native people and not just in their history class. Um, and, and also in different ways with sound and touch. And I've even gone to the classroom and, and brought some fry bread. Um, so they even get to taste native culture a little bit. And, and it, it is so significant for those students. We've been doing that for a very long time now. Um, and some of those kids are, are in ninth grade and I come back and they're like, oh my gosh, I remember fry bread was the best I've ever had. And, and it, it, it stuck with them for so long. Um, it's important to give equal weight to indigenous ways of learning and historical record um, and Western practices. A uh, great example of that is many tribal communities um, keep their records through oral tradition. Things were not written down like they were in, in typical Western practices, but that does not mean that our history and our traditions that are passed down from generation to generation hold any less weight. Um, they, they are that is historical record of what happened here, um, and it should be um, acknowledged and honored. How can we create change today? It's important to not let your idea of perfection get in the way of progress. Uh, we, had a, we had a wonderful example of this, the um, Montclair Land Acknowledgement, um, you know, they recognize it's still a work in progress, but at least it's there. I've worked with groups who had, you know, goals of doing things, uh, particularly land acknowledgements, and they say, oh, you know, we've been trying to do this for three years, but we couldn't get a Native person to come in and talk to us. And I said, well, why did you wait three years? You could have done some Googling, you could have sent out a few emails to have something. Um, our tribal website has a kind of general land acknowledgement that you could at least use. You know, you spent three years missing out on an opportunity to educate others because you had a blinders view of how you wanted this to turn out. Um, it's important to educate yourself. Um, with the link for today's event, there's quite a few links for um, some books and some videos um, about uh, Native history and Lenape history. It's important to be an everyday ally, um, speaking out against stereotypes in, in the spaces that you are in. Um, supporting your local tribal communities and their needs, um, and also buying indigenous crafts and products. Um, it, uh, a lot of native crafts are appropriated and sold in mass production for $5 and all that good stuff. Um, if you really wanna be an ally, spend a couple extra dollars to make sure you're getting something that was made in the right way. Our crafts have ceremonial significance and there is a certain way that they are supposed to be done. So honor that way by supporting native crafters. Support a state requirement of Native American history in schools um, and create a safe space for your indigenous students, um, which can be a long process but I think that it is so important. Um, I, I, I know students who don't acknowledge their indigeneity in their classrooms because they are nervous of being made fun of or rejected. 
Um, so it is important to create a space where a student can feel like they can be indigenous in whatever way they define being indigenous. Um, we're living in an exciting time where, like the uh, demographic checkbox thing, you don't have to check just one. Being able to identify myself as an Afro-Indigenous person is so emotionally significant for me because I did grow up in a time where you had to check one or the other or something was wrong with you. Um, so uh, allowing Native students to be Native in whatever way they want to express that. Maybe some of them will want to speak about their culture in your classrooms. Maybe some of them won't. And that is completely their right. Okay, so that was my little presentation. Um, if there are any questions, I wanted to leave I'm about on time. I wanted to leave some time for questions. Thank you, Ms. Norwood. That was really, really wonderful. Um, it was so meaningful to hear from you. It definitely taught me a lot. Um, it's hard, I think, as a teacher, as an educator, even as a teacher educator, even someone who tries so hard to have um, a critical perspective and an anti-racist perspective, it's still hard to imagine what it's like to be a Native American student sitting in a classroom, um, celebrating Thanksgiving with the class or looking at some aspect of US history or New Jersey history, including Native American history and seeing it through your eyes. So thank you for sharing those very personal stories and your very personal reactions. Um, it means a lot. And I think it really helps us all understand um, something a little differently about our, our responsibility as educators and the work we do in the classroom. It's hard, you know, and some of the comments in the chat box, which have been uh, terrific and really helpful, you know, have people who are, who are asking questions. How do I do this? How do I learn more about that? Um, how can I be better? So I'd like to share some of those questions with you and Dr. Brooks with you as well. So these are kind of questions that I will put to both of you. Um, I'm just gonna kind of go in, in, in order here. And if you're uh, in the audience and you have a question, now is the time to put the question in the Q&A box. That's gonna be where I will see it and we'll, where we'll get a chance to get to it if we can. So um, feel free to add your questions now. Uh, the first question comes from Marissa, who would like some clarification on the appropriate terminology to use when discussing and teaching about Native Americans. Um, this can be confusing, and uh, not everyone is sure what the preferred terminology or the appropriate terminology is. So could you all please help us understand what we're supposed to do as teachers? Okay, <laughs> I wasn't sure who's going first. <laughs> um, so in my understanding, um, uh, indigenous has been a term that has become popular to define indigenous people in a international sense, the first nations people anywhere you are. Um, Native American is a term that has been coined really just for in interacting with native people in the entire continent, generally for just for people in the US, um, the term First Nations is much more popular um, when you go to Canada. Um, so I would say, um, and, and Dr. Brooks, I, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, the, the best term to use um, is indigenous um, because it is inclusive. And I think that it fights the concept of borders for native people, um, you know, I, we have tribal relatives that cross those borders um, into Canada and even into Mexico. Um, so I like to use the term indigenous when I'm talking about um, native people at large, but, but I have heard the term indigenous and native or native American used interchangeably because of where we are. I think it's a little, okay, yeah, you, great job. Trinity, that was just lovely. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just, I could listen to you all day. <laughs> um, I, it was, it's just, it was a really great presentation. Um, yeah, so for me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm been 
I'm from Oklahoma, you know, that's, that's where I'm at, right? That's my, my cultural space. And, and, um, you know, I was, I was raised, I was yelled at by people say, you say American Indian, don't you use that crap Native American, like, like, they would just really get into me. That's something scholars tell you to use. But then it became so popular, nobody was using it. And there was, you know, you know, cultures interact with each other, right? So when I see, you know, uh, Indian people talking to each other, we use the term Indian, you know, because, it, it, you know, this is an Indian thing. No, don't worry, it's an Indian thing, you know? So that's something that I find, I feel very comfortable with. I love hearing Trinity say the word, I just love that. But when I hear people outside of that space, sometimes evoking that word, it can become, I think in a sense, like a, you know, I always get that little warning bells, you know? So I, I would say like, as a person, you know, as a, as a person just out there in the world trying to teach students to stick with Native American. I think that for me, that's, you know, from where I'm from and from what my experiences as, as an educator for a really long time, indigeneity helps. We express things in a bigger global sense when you're trying to really get to, okay, here's what the Lakota people experienced. These Native Americans did this in response. Like, that's where I would stick to, um, you know, using that term. But don't be offended if you see other, you know, Indians using it with each other. You know, there's a long history with words, right? All of, all of the words, even the names of tribes were given to us. You know, the, the name of, uh, you know, Choctaw is an English word, you know, that uh, with the, our language broken into pieces, right? So, so um, just understand that it's all part of a, a larger internal joke maybe, or, or, you know, conversation that we have with ourselves. Uh, so I hope that helps a little. Excellent, thank you. Um, yeah, I think it is helpful. Uh, when at all, when at all possible, um, you know, for teachers to speak specifically about the tribe or nation that they are teaching about, that can be helpful as well. So if you can distinguish between the specific um, tribe, nation, or cultural group you're talking about, you can use those terms as well. That can be helpful. Um, okay, moving through our questions. There's a lot of questions, Trinity, <laughs> asking for help um, in terms of resources. And there's kind of a, a couple of different ways people are looking for help. Um, one is, are there any resources that you would recommend in New Jersey for helping to bring Native American people or voices or perspectives into the classroom, especially folks from New Jersey? Um, and I saw in the chat box, someone mentioned they used a podcast in their classroom. And I thought, you know, that seems like a good resource to share. So I guess, you know, I know that you do a lot of work working with teachers in schools and that you do do school visits and classroom visits. But seeing as you are only one person, um, I thought you would like to maybe help us understand what kind of opportunities teachers could pursue if they were interested in um, having a native speaker or at least bringing native voices into the classroom. And then another related question is looking for texts and sources and books related to New Jersey Native American history specifically. Um, so I, I know you have some, some ideas about that as well. Absolutely. Well, for um, text for things specifically about Lenape Hoking um, and natives here in New Jersey, uh, there is it is, uh, there's a website, I believe it's nanticoclenapemuseum.org. Um, it has a lot of information. Um, it is, uh, it's, all this information has been compiled by my father, um, Reverend Dr. John Norwood. Um, and on there, there is a link to a ebook he created called uh, We Are Still Here. Um, it is a small book that really highlights specifically um, Lenape people and it, it, it goes through time to, you know, how we hid in plain sight during the 1800s so that we could stay here in our traditional lands into how, you know, we, we had our, organ, our tribal um, government structures hid in churches in the early 1900s to, you know, coming out and, and organizing outside of the churches. Um, so I would say for Lenape history here in New Jersey and, and in Delaware, our tribes are, are interrelated. That is a, is a great reference. Um, and, and it's it's a quick, pretty quick read. It's not too, too many pages. Um, there are also some links right on that website that have a lot of information, not just about our tribal communities historically, uh, but a, a lot of our, our culture um, that I think would be great resources for teachers. Um, getting a native person uh, to come and speak to your classrooms, I would suggest reaching out actually our tribal website 
Um, we, we do have um, tribal representative speakers who do come and do educational programs. Um, so if you can reach out to the website, um, you, they can usually get you to somebody who can help you out with that. But also, I, I will say it, the podcast, there are quite a few Native podcasts that I enjoy listening to um, that just give interesting perspectives on being Indigenous in today's world. Um, that, so that the podcast idea, I think, is a great idea. Thanks, Trinity. Yeah, we will we will work on updating that um, Google Doc. That Google Doc is a is a live document, so we can add more um, specific podcasts and suggestions about books and websites there. Um, Dr. Brooks, was there anything you wanted to add in terms of resources for educators in New Jersey? So, educators in New Jersey, I would say it's you know I, I teach um, I teach classes at um, you know to you know, at Montclair State that, that I, I use um, certain pieces and I, I put um, as one of the answer questions there. I mean, I find that a lot of, you know, people really want to know, well, what do they believe or what, you know, people are really looking for information that can be, um, that's just not there, right? And there's a reason why a lot of the internal workings of the Chickasaws or the Navajo isn't just laid to bear for everyone because of appropriation, because, you know, it's, you don't walk into, you know, any, any um, institution or any, um, cultural group and just know the you know all of it it's just not it's not for the disposal or use every piece of it for everyone so you know to kind of piece that together can be very difficult because i think um, as a group we have a long history of being um you know anything that's put out there can be used against us you know to some extent so i i would just hedge you know your patience with that that while your intentions are, are wonderful and trying to get that information please be patient that sometimes the, the lack of information you have to kind of work your way around so one of my suggestions was find out what people are saying and work your way backwards right so if you want to know um there was a never alone game uh, you want to know about what what a what a tribe believes there was an alaskan tribe that created the never alone i believe um video game and you can see a quick snapshot of it um it, just a quick a trailer of it on youtube and it really kind of emphasizes like this is a, what a tribe can do when given um you know the advances in technology and what they want to communicate to their youth how amazing is that you know this is what they're saying to their own youth. So as an outside observer, you're like, oh, I get it. That's the importance. That's my focal, that's what their focal point is. Look at these things. Look at the story that they're trying to teach their youth. And it's so non-invasive to view people's interactions in that way, right? So instead of always, you're not gonna get, you know, all the time a representative to come, you know, to every door, even though it'd be great if we did, you know, having a, a, a total, you know, um, push of information to all the classrooms, but that's just kind of not how it works. Um, and I would also say you could work backwards. I think whenever you have a chance to see art, our um, Native artists work in a way of, of, of really pointing out the hypocrisy of society or the viewpoints of modern culture. I mean, there's a lot of artists that are, you know, they go back to their tribes or, you know, I know of one in particular would go back and, and they would wanna know, well, why aren't you, you know, painting about traditional things? Why are you painting Yoda, right? Why are you painting, you know, this or that? And it's, it's, a, it's a cultural critique, right? So your students can look at an image from a modern native artist and, and, and explain and analyze all kinds of things about culture, what's going on or the messaging that's taking place there, you know, from, native to western society or from native to native person you know like that's that's a big deal i would also say that all oral histories and memoirs related to oral histories are incredibly valuable and library of congress has a lot of images that i use as well and i would also say two other things um so i did put in you know i love wendy red star she has pictures that even fourth graders can understand there's a picture of um the last supper but it's done in Thanksgiving. I can't remember what it's called, and um, and it's a it's a very it you can understand a perspective, you know, of Thanksgiving from uh from her her perspective, you know. So so there's a lot of things that that can be um, deconstructed that way. Also, I found it incredibly valuable in New Jersey when I teach students that have no like that will literally say. I don't remember ever going through K-12 education and even hearing about a Native American one time. And so, which happens to me very often, um, and I, you know, in, in my own classes, so I do a lot of work with um, the 1491s, um, have a YouTube channel, but I don't use the, I don't use all of it. It's not appropriate for K-12, but they do have some very small represent videos 
that are really, really good of, of people on college campuses doing dancing or, you know, like the, there's one where um, uh, grabs a towel folding laundry and then starts dancing, you know, it starts, you know, it, it, there's, there's a, um, a lot of celebration in that and a lot of things that can be gleaned by students for these things. And I think that that kind of work that, you know, we were talking about primary sources, right? That, that work really does well. If you have uh, older students, I would always, again, that's why I mentioned earlier, um, the American Indian Quarterly is done, you know, the editors of that are, are my heroes, you know, so I would say that's always a good place. If you're looking for people to do investigation and uh, do that higher level work with research, or, you know, you want them to see things um, from a different way, uh, that's where I would start with older students. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. That was fantastic. That was amazing. I love how much information you can share uh, so quickly. Um, okay, we are, believe it or not, at the end of our program, but we have one more question that I want to um, throw out there, even though we only have two more minutes. And the question is this from Brian, essentially this, um, how do I do better? How do I do more teaching about um, contemporary Native American people and stories of joy and resistance and resilience. Um, do you have any suggestions on how teachers can kind of try to overcome some of the themes that we see so heavily emphasized in our textbooks, um, getting away from the stories of trauma, like, like um, Ms. Norwood said, and embracing stories that are really different, kind of on the opposite spend, end of the spectrum? Um, the first thing that came to uh, my mind, talking about the 1491s, is YouTube has become a great tool of ex expression for young Native people. Um, and, and I use it all the time for my presentations. Um, there, there's quite a few groups that do videos about expressing themselves, being proud of who they are as Indigenous people, um, and, and sharing their culture in, in a space where they're comfortable. Um, so I, I, I say YouTube is, is a wonderful example. Um, I'll be honest, I have, I have just um, gone on uh, social media and found native groups. Uh, there's a lot of native groups that you can, uh, I, I work with, uh, I live close to Philly, so I work, work with quite a few groups in Philly um, that, you know, you can become a part of as a non-Indigenous person and um, be able to glean and they share links of stuff where you can uh, you know, read articles about what native people are doing across the country and pride, um, particularly during the month of November, there's a lot of education out there on social media about how to respectfully you know, appreciate Native American History Month, how to tackle Columbus Day, Thanksgiving and things of that nature. So uh, YouTube and social media has definitely done a lot of great things um, for native people being able to have a voice um, in, a, in a modern time. That was excellent. Dr. Brooks, anything to add on that final question? No, but I just want to say thank you again. I think, you know, activities like this and people like you that have joined, um, and I want to thank all the participants here, you know, as well. This is such a big deal, you know, and every time that we get the opportunity to say anything at all, it, it makes a huge difference. You know, we touch so many lives as teachers and educators. So I'm just so grateful, you know, for everyone here and, and for Dr. Burkholder putting this together. Excellent. That was a wonderful closing sentiment. Um, and I share it and I'm so grateful to you and to Ms. Norwood for, for doing this work with us here at Montclair State University. It's a commitment, commitment we're making um, throughout the university and we're working on it. You know, we have far to go and we have a long road ahead of us, but we are, we are really working on it and we have new forms of support from our administration, including our new university president, certainly faculty and students who have shown an enormous interest in this. Um, we hope for all of you uh, to be developing a full day workshop on Native American education and teaching Native American history in the fall. So uh, we've captured your email addresses from your registration today, and we will send you an announcement about that if it comes together in the fall. I hope that it does. And um, I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for joining us. I dropped a link in the chat to um, a professional development certificate for teachers. I'll drop it there again in a second. 
And uh, you're welcome to use that in order to document your professional development hours today. As a final note, uh, this program has been recorded and we're gonna be able to uh, publish it on the MSU uh, YouTube channel. And I will send out a link to that recording once we have that processed uh, in a few days. So you people have been texting and asking, you know, how do we, how do we access this again? How do I share it with my colleagues? Um, so that will be a place to start. Uh, in closing, and I want to respect your time, we are done here. In closing, I just want to say thanks again to Ms. Norwood, to Dr. Brooks, and to all of you for joining us here today. I'm going to drop that link again to the Professional Development Certificate, but thanks so much for joining us. Have a terrific afternoon, and goodbye, everyone.